Welcome to our SWC Spotlight webinar for Spring 2019. I am especially excited about this one because today we are taking a look at the course of our first ever award winner for excellence in online teaching. Lisa Ballesteros is here to talk about all the wonderful things she is doing with her students and she's going to give us a little peek into her course. The first thing that I wanted to talk about was the award. In its first incarnation, we were really happy to have a lot of nominations submitted. In fact, we had 236 nominations in this award period. And here is the part that just really warms my heart. 95% of those were nominations from our students. They weren't doing this for an assignment. They weren't doing this for extra credit. They weren't even doing it for recognition because they're all anonymous, but they did it because a teacher of theirs moved them, helped them, supported them, made a difference in their lives. And that is just incredible. 95% of our 236 nominations came from students who wanted to show how much they appreciated an online instructor. We had a total of 79 individual instructors nominated, which is a huge number. And from that very big group, the selection committee, which consisted of faculty, staff, and uh, students, put together a list of 15 finalists. And those finalists were selected using the Excellence in Online Teaching Award rubric. So this is the rubric that we used as part of the process. We looked at the information that the nominators provided to us. We also looked at the course tour video that the instructor shared with us so that we could take a look at their course through a video. And then we also asked the instructors a couple of questions to gather information to better assess some of these things. So we looked at course design, learning environment, the instructional content, so how the instructor was teaching the subject matter online. We also looked at regular effective contact and online assessments. And the last thing that we looked at was accessibility. The committee used this rubric and the finalists emerged and then they had a very hard job of picking just one person for this award because wow, do we have a lot of fabulous things happening in our online classes. But we had to pick one and we did and it was Lisa. So I wanted to share with you a couple of things that her nominators said about her teaching and about her course, just to give you a sense of what we're going to see in a minute when she is so kind as to share a little bit of her teaching with us. So one of the things that uh, we see here in this first one is the use of video. The professor uses video interactions to develop her teaching. The student says the learning experience is almost compared to that of being in a classroom. So it felt like it was a, a live class with other students and an engaged instructor. And that's so important in an online environment. Uh, the second one noted the extra information that the instructor shared, resources, online materials that related to the topic, which also of course speaks to engagement. And then this one, I have to say that the um, committee who was selecting for this award was especially impressed with this. Every chapter has an introductory video. So she is there with her students every week of the course, introducing the material and providing video lecture content. The next two comments that I wanna share are a little bit meatier and they really speak to not just the content, but the presentation, the instructor presence that's in the course. So the first one, talks about the, her, the amazing job at communicating. I felt I knew her and had never met her. And I feel it is important for online professors to establish a relationship with their students because it allows us as students to comfortably approach our professors online. That was pretty profound. So <laughs> if, if we think about all of the students who maybe fill up the back row of a face-to-face -face class, they're in the online class too. What can make them feel more comfortable coming to the front? And so Lisa has found the secret sauce of being approachable <laughs> and having her students feel like they know her. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll take a look at, at how she has done that in a couple of minutes. And then the last one, I, it, it, it almost feels like a plant, but I swear this was a real comment from a nominator. <laughs> I was very skeptical when I initially decided to take an online course. 
So here we have the skeptic who by the end becomes a convert. Mm -hmm. So at the end, the student says, however, I enjoyed everything about her course and teaching. So went from being a skeptic saying, I don't think online is for me. I'll just try one to at the end saying, I loved it. Mm -hmm. So that's a great testimonial. Uh, so with those, I wanted to give us a chance to actually talk with Lisa a little bit and then take a look into her course too. So I'm gonna stop my screen share. And Lisa, how does it feel? Um, it's a little overwhelming. I'm not used to this kind of attention. <laughs> but at the same time, I'm excited to share what I've done because as many of you know, um, teaching online is difficult. It's isolating. Um, you don't get that immediate feedback that you get in the classroom. You, it's, it's hard to know if students are getting it. It's hard to know if students like the class. Um, so this award feels kind of um, like, a, a, I feel validated <laughs> as a teacher because we, we're often um, kind of, up until now, I think, you know, we're kind, kind of coming into our time, but, um, teaching for 16 years online, I've often felt as like the stepchild <laughs> of faculty and, and maybe we don't um, get as much respect or, um, you know, people often will say little things that perpetuate the idea that we're in our pajamas and teaching and nothing drives me more nuts than when <laughs> people make those comments. Um, so just having this award uh, and that we're going to continue giving it to exceptional faculty in the future just makes me really happy to kind of finally get us at the same level as everybody else and um, and then also giving us the opportunity to share things that we so that we can learn from each other because it's hard to do that um, not only in the physical classroom but online and so um, I'm overwhelmed by this <laughs> this award I'm, I'm really grateful and and appreciate all of you being here to see what I've done in my course. So <laughs> I, I really think the more that we share what we're doing, the more we support each other, the more we give each other ideas. And I mean, what we do, all, all of us as teachers can feel kind of isolating. If you're face to face, you're still just you in the classroom. How often do we get time to actually see how other people teach something? And online, I feel like we, we have such a great opportunity because we can do things like this. Uh, we can share screens with Zoom. So I, I feel like we really are at a place where we can start to break down those walls and, and really learn with each other. And yeah. so this award has been a great way to, to kind of raise that, raise that awareness for sure. Yeah. Um, so and it's, it's nice to, you know, we don't have to recreate the wheel every time. You know, you know I, I, I'm taking things from different people all the time and, and utilizing the commons. Um, and just to have all those resources help me become a better instructor and so again I'm, I'm just really excited to be able to share things with everyone today so should I go ahead and jump in yes let's okay. so I'm so I'm just going to start off um Tracy had asked me to kind of talk about what what guides me in my online teaching and there's this great article from the Chronicle of Higher Education it's an article I read a while back ago and I often go back to it to kind of help remind me of what I should be doing in my online classes. And so these are the 10 essential principles and practices of better online teaching. Um, the title of the article is how to be a better online teacher and advice guide. And before I begin showing my class, I just, you know, want to emphasize that this is just one example of, you know, how I do it. And I think what is really great is um, picking and choosing what may work for your discipline and your teaching style. So as I was going through these um, 10 points, reviewing them again, as I was preparing for today, I was kind of going through the checklist. Am I still doing that? You know, you kind of have to review with yourself. Am I still doing that? How am I doing it? And so the first one is just show up for class. And I interpret that as regular and effective contact. There's so many tools, like I use a show me app. I teach statistics online for the social and behavioral sciences. And so I use a, an app called show, show me and it really helps me mimic what I would do in the classroom on the whiteboard. And there are a lot of ways that we can engage in regular and effective contact. The online um, office hours, 
um, that I do every day on a weekly basis. All of these things though have become easier to do with Canvas. Canvas has been a, a great tool to help me um, address regular and effective contact. And as I'm gonna go through these points as quickly as I can, hopefully you'll see examples of all of these things in, in my um, example module. Be yourself. Um, one of the ways that I try to do that is interject my voice in my announcements, doing some video announcements when possible. Um, interjecting some humor. I think all of us as instructors, we, we tell jokes, goofy ones at times, <laughs> but that's part of, you know, our performance. You know, we are performers, we're educators, but we're also performers. In, in online instruction, sometimes that disappears because we can't share ourselves. So I try to use um, video recordings for my announcements as often as I can. My dean, Cynthia McGregor, had shared with me a, an app called My Talking Pet app, <laughs> which I'm not sure if any of you have seen. If there's time, I'll show you, but it's where you can have an image of, it, of your favorite animal or generic animal and then record your voice. And so I always do uh, my voice with a little picture of a kitty cat that says how important it is to watch, uh, read all the announcements. And students think it's hilarious. <laughs> I think it's hilarious, but I haven't even seen it. Okay. <laughs> it's silly, but um, it's good to do at the beginning of the semester because it kind of dispels um, this idea that I'm a robot. It, and also because of the discipline that I'm teaching statistics, a lot of students are coming with a lot of fear and anxiety. So I try to put that out there and be goofy so that I, I tend to be very proper. And so sometimes I have to work through that and... Um, and find ways to be funny in an online setting that may be more natural in the, in the classroom. Put yourself in their shoes. I always try to, as I'm developing a new module or new material, I always go into the student view and click through things and, and see where the roadblocks are. I also have my husband who's an instructor too and my kids who are getting older and, and are able to help me. I'll say, sit here and tell me what doesn't make sense. So I have them look at the material and um, we try to put ourselves in their shoes so that I can anticipate those roadblocks and be ready for them or adjust accordingly. Organize the course content intuitively. I just designed for everybody. <laughs> you just think about, you know, the ways that everyone can access your material, then it, it just becomes easier for everyone. I try to create my course where there are a lot of ways to access the material because I want to minimize what we refer to as cognitive overload. I don't want them to get lost in the technicalities of the course. I want them to be able to learn the material with, and you know, we're just using technology as a vehicle. Add visual appeal, so I use banners, and they're not fancy. I'm not very artistic at all. <laughs> But I wanted to brand my, my course in a way that, um, you know, when they go to my course, they know it's my course, and then images when necessary, and obviously videos, either um, curated videos or um, instructor-led videos. And research shows that students tend to learn better when something's presented in video format. Explain your instructions and expectations. We think that just providing directions or instructions in text is enough. But as we probably all experienced, we have a, you know, students turn in things that, you know, was way left field and you wonder how did that happen? So I try to anticipate that. I provide videos of the instructions, walking them through. I try to be as explicit as possible in my instructions and then explain my expectations by showing student examples and then including rubrics. And then along those lines, when I give feedback, um, I will redirect them and sometimes the things that I have done aren't enough and so when I grade their work I'll kind of give them the feedback necessary and then refer them back to those resources or again to the um, examples of other student work. Scaffolding learning activities so I, I use research that shows chunking information is best so our brains work better when we're given little bits at a time and in statistics, that's really applicable because, you know, just reading chapter one from beginning to end of statistics is overwhelming. So I try to chunk things and then scaffold the learning with different assignments that, you know, give me feedback and give the students feedback about how they're doing, how they're understanding and comprehending the material. 
provide examples. I've already mentioned some of that in terms of explaining the expectations, make class inviting and pleasant to be in. That, you know, again, is, is hard to do in an online environment, but one way that I try to do that is really focus on compassion. I try to create an environment where I want my students to feel comfortable. They can talk to me about all kinds of things, not only what we're learning about, but things that are happening to them personally. My announcements every week, I have a welcome to week eight. You know, I just tried to make it exciting because statistics is hard to make it, <laughs> but at least there um, every week I'm, I'm welcoming them to learning something new. And, and I just try to interject as much warmth um, in my text when I do write something in an announcement, again, trying to make them feel comfortable. And then lastly, commit to continuous improvement. At the very beginning of my statistics course, I have a diagnostic assessment to see where the students are in terms of their skills, their math skills. And then throughout the semester, I have formative and, and summative assessments that not only inform the students of how they're doing, but it informs me in, in terms of, did I explain that well? If I consistently show that students are understanding a particular concept and it's across the board, I recognize I need to redo something. I have to address the deficiencies in my teaching and my presentation material. And students use it to, to address the deficiencies they are illustrating in terms of their understanding. So the article is fabulous, so I encourage you to um, read it. So at this time, I'm going to go over to my course and just show you the example module. So this is week two. So front page always changes. And, um, and the, one of the reasons that it does is because when I was thinking about design, I didn't want a stagnant front page all the time. I want it to be more dynamic that every week when, as we change the material that we're learning and as we're scaffolding the material, that I wanted it, the front page to reflect that new material. So I always have the three most recent announcements posted on my homepage and then I have a usually a curated video. This is just something visual that they can um, latch on to and get introduced to the concepts before we jump into the reading, before we jump into my lecture. Stats lectures aren't that dynamic <laughs> so I need to, like a hook, something to get them excited and I find that something that's visually appealing helps get them motivated um, and with every video, I always provide a little um, text as to what they're going to see. And it's really, it can be one sentence to, you know, two or three sentences, just introducing what they're going to see. And then I have these you know, shortcut buttons to always remind them green means go. <laughs> so go to the green button and begin chapter one. And so we'll go ahead and do that. Um, so it takes us to the modules and we begin with the overview and I'm sure having gone through DEFT and, and uh, we all have this kind of introduction or overview where I have the learning objectives and again here's the banner that I created using Canva and uh, the to-do list this is pretty typical of um, most classes and from there I begin with the course content. I'll give them a reading assignment. Again, here's an illustration of the chunking of information. So here I instruct them to read section 1.1. And this is easier to do in, in you know, a course like math or statistics because the textbooks are usually written in that format where they have little sections. So I'll instruct them to read a certain section of the text and each section has its corresponding um, lecture. And these lecture, all my lectures have been closed captioned. Making of the videos, it takes time, but you know, it's like doing the lecture in class. And um, once they watch the lecture videos and I remind them, you know, take notes while you're watching these um, lecture videos. After they've watched um, and covered one to two sections, so this is, they, here they're covering section 1.1 and 1.2, then I have a short little what I refer to as a learning check quiz and um, it's kind of low stakes, you know, it's, it's not, a, not a lot of consequences in terms of, you know, oh, I have, I'm being quizzed. It's a quick little assessment. Did you comprehend what we read? 
in statistics, you know, you, everything is um, cumulative. We build upon the skills with each section, with each chapter, with each part, um, all preparing us for um, meeting the learning objectives for the course. So they have the opportunity to assess themselves and, and for me to get that feedback as to whether or not they understood the material. And then we go on to more material. So chapter one in, in this stats book is um, really heavy on terminology. So I do a combination of text lecture and then video. And then I try to incorporate other um, interesting quality curated videos to help support what I'm presenting to the students. Again, keeping the structure the same, reading assignment and then the lecture that follows. And here's an example of when I want to find a balance between scrolling and nexting. <laughs> so I try to use um, tabs to kind of consolidate. So this section is quite long. Instead of them going from page to page or scrolling, I remind them, you know, to view all the tabs. And, and again, within these tabs, I've included curated videos. So it's a combination of different ways of presenting material. And again, um, once we've covered a couple sections, we take a quick little assessment to make sure, okay, I understand what, what um, was just presented. And they're encouraged to go back and review the section if they didn't do very well on these quick little learning check quizzes. And here, as we start to get into more of the notation um, and statistics, I have some demonstration videos. So you get the gist of the pattern of chunking the information and giving students opportunity to assess themselves and give me an opportunity to, to get feedback from how they're doing on those quizzes. Once they've completed all of that, they move on to completing their homework. So here, as I mentioned, you know, explain your explanations or your instructions. So I have the instructions written in text, but I also created a video um, showing them what I want them to do and how to do it. I've embedded the um, homework, the problems that they need to print out, and then they are instructed to handwrite their answers because I, I really believe in the process of writing and, you know, and your brain retaining information when you engage in that activity. And I have very specific instructions in terms of them highlighting their final answers, and then they also need to check their work. So since I have large class maxes, I have 45 students, it's hard for me to, to grade homework in terms of accuracy. So the way I address that was I encourage them to complete the homework on their own and not to be afraid if they make mistakes. And then, and even if they skip a problem, they don't know how to do it. Some students will write, I don't know how to do this then they are instructed to check their work with these solution videos. So I have the solutions for every problem that's been assigned to them. So again, I used an app called Show Me to create these and I've um, organized them by tab so they can find the video or the problem that they want to see worked out and they're all closed captioned. And so Lisa, they, you, you work out the problems problem by problem Yes. Uh, using video. So you're sitting there with them as they're doing their homework, ready to explain something to them. Yes. And I always, wow. you know, I, I joke a lot about how they can pause me, they can fast forward. It is a lot of time for them to spend watching these, but I tell them you don't have to watch all of the videos if you got the answer right for number 19 or number 21. They can skip that information, but as we progress in the chapters, they really need that you know, step-by-step -step illustration of how to complete a problem. And the students will say things that I feel like you're sitting right next to me. I can come up with a question, but then I, you know, play and then usually you address that question. And if I don't, they can always reach out to me and I can, in a lot of cases, create another video and send it to them directly. 
So they check their work. So before they submit their homework, they have to go through these process, all these steps of completing the homework and then correcting it. And I actually want to see them like marking their own work um, incorrect. Some students will do it in a different color. I'm not very specific of how they do it. Students have become really creative. Some students will put a little smiley face next to the ones they got correct. And then a question mark next to the ones that they had problems with. But then once they see the solution, I still expect complete homework. So even if they were having, they were challenged by it, they still have to submit it complete and they can complete it by using the solution videos. So that whole process uh, attributes to the, to the learning of the material. Then the technical part is for them to scan it as a PDF and upload it. And I found a fabulous video, a little tutorial of how to do that. So some students have never used um, this app called Cam Scanner. It's a fabulous app, really easy to use. They just take a, their mobile device, take a picture of their homework it converts it to a PDF and they can um, easily upload it to Canvas. So I include this little video. And then I also provide examples. And here's one that put smiley faces <laughs> next to um, their work. And it gives me joy because they're happy they got it right. So they've watched the lecture videos, they read the text, and they're understanding and and they're highlighting their final answers. But this shows to me that they're enjoying the class. You know, and this student in particular has said, I, I thought I was going to hate this class. I'm afraid of numbers and all of these things that, you know, they come to my class just petrified about having to take statistics. And this brings me great joy because I imagine just making those little happy faces makes that student feel good <laughs> about themselves. And it's a quick way for them to um, determine if they're understanding the material. And it, it helps because I'm one person and I have large class maxes, they don't have to wait for me to grade something. So three weeks from now, I, I'm not telling them, oh, you're, you're totally off, <laughs> off track. I mean, by then it's hard for them to get back on track. So they can quickly assess where their needs are, where the holes in their knowledge is and um, that it, it minimizes that negative aspect of larger class sizes and I'm able to give them feedback in, in a different way. I just you know, decided this is the way, better way to do it. It was creative. Some you know, students are kind of confused, like you're gonna give us the solutions and I explained to them, it's not about getting it right or wrong, it's the process of learning. And so the homework is really just graded on completion because they have access to the solutions. But they just, um, I think, really help reinforce the material. Just to clarify, Lisa, so it sounds to me like you're not giving them an answer key. You're giving them the solutions to the problem. You're working through it with them in that video so yeah. that they can understand not just the answer, but the process. Right. They can use the Appendix C, the back of the text, to check their answers. But Appendix C just has the answer. Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, their handwritten work, part of the rubric shows that they show their handwritten work. So they can't just write the answer. <laughs> so the solution videos walk them through step by step of how to arrive at the answer in the back of the book. Um, and then my rubric is really generic, very basic. And again, as I mentioned, it's focusing on um, is it complete? You know, did they, are they illustrating that they um, checked their work and that they corrected it? If there's a, an answer that's incorrect, I want to see that they marked it wrong, however they want to do that, and then they show the correct um, solution. And by then, that, that usually helps, but if they still are having problems or challenge, then they can come back to me for some more help. And one of the ways that they do that is um, I have an assignment that refers to, I refer to as muddiest point. Um, and I was so thrilled to find this image that, and it was legal to use. <laughs> um, because this is sometimes, this is what students sometimes feel like. Even after they've gone through lectures, even after they've done the homework, they're like, it may just be one thing. Like, I don't understand what standard deviation is, how to compute it, how to use it. And so here they um, are encouraged to discuss some of those things that they're still challenged by. So 
I'm just going to show you an example. I did get permission from some of my students. Um, here's a student that um, mentioned levels of measurement uh, are still difficult for her to understand. And so here I respond with some text and, and a wonderful curated video from, that I found on YouTube. Students will help each other um, in some instances. And here is where I try to be compassionate and, and um, interject some warmth um, in terms of recognizing and saying, you know, a lot of students struggle with this. And in, in this case, it's true. The scales of measurement are repeatedly, historically, uh, a concept that a lot of students struggle with. And so I want them to know that it's not just them. So I try to incorporate, you know, different what, languages. <laughs> like, you know, I might be speaking Chinese to them and the book is, you know, in Portuguese. And now this video speaks their language. So I try to provide as many different ways of explaining um, complex material so that they, so the light bulb goes off. And again, I mentioned um, they help each other in some regards. I've had some students create their own videos or record themselves solving a problem when they really get into it. And in this case, you know, I might refer back to a section. So here, this little hyperlink, I'll remind them, go, go back and review this section. You might have missed it and give some examples. Um, and so here is this other illustrations of students helping each other. Um, so once they've completed the muddiest point discussion board, hopefully we've addressed all the gaps <laughs> or the majority of the gaps in their um, knowledge. They're ready to take a formative assessment. So the learning checks are formative. The end of chapter quiz is formative as well in the sense that it, it is, the items are coming from a pool. So everyone's quiz is going to be slightly different, but if students, they're encouraged to check their answers, like which ones they got wrong. And in most cases, they recognize, oh, I see why I got that wrong. But in some cases, they're like, I don't understand why I got this question wrong. And they'll email me or they'll send a little message within the quiz in Canvas and say, can you help me better understand? And I'm just going to switch over to my show me so i'll prepare a little video for them so um, this last week a student had two items that they wanted more instruction on and so i'll create those and then send it to them directly so they now understand okay i got these wrong and now they have the solutions to those videos or those problems i don't post those publicly because students take their quizzes at varying times and then i make them private within my show me so that um, hopefully they're, they're not shared <laughs> from semester to semester and once they've completed the quiz and addressed all of their issues then i end with our basic um, review of what we set out to learn and the activities that help us address those learning objectives. And as we've all been taught to, you know, we congratulate them because it is a lot of work and then we'll see them next week. And then the next week begins with welcome to week three. <laughs> well, welcome to week four. Forgot to share point number 10 was commit yourself to improving and changing and making updates. So I took something from the Commons. Barbara Ilowowski has a couple courses posted, and she does. She has a couple examples of midterm self-assessment. And I asked them these questions. They provide really great feedback. Um, and this is midway through the semester. Like, what's working for you? What's not? What could I do differently? And what are you going to commit to to making sure that you know you do better, or you continue to do um, as you're doing in and being successful. And then at the end of the term, I have a, a summative <laughs> assessment of how the whole course overall and um, this image really epitomizes, you know, I like it, I don't like it. <laughs> and they can take a, a survey or they can submit their feedback in these other ways. And that's really helpful for me to collect that information at the midpoint, midterm point, I can make these quick adjustments, perhaps, uh, if I see consistency or common themes. But then at the end of the term, I can use that for the next semester, which is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, we have four minutes left. I wonder what we could squeeze into four minutes. Um, my cat video? Yes. <laughs> so 
So here goes. Hello, everyone. Please be sure to read all announcements. They contain important information. Thank you. <laughs> it cracks me up every time. <laughs> And students, when I post it, you know, they'll, they're like, I love cats and this, <laughs> like all the comments and they just think it's hilarious. And it, it, you know, it helps them see me in a different light. I think all of us have felt like our students when they email us repeatedly at one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and they're wondering why we're not responding. They have this idea, this notion that we're computers or robots or something. And so it kind of helps me. So Lila wants to know, how exactly did you make that cat video? What app did you use? It, the app's called My Talking Pet App. And you can upload an image of your own pet. Really fun to do at the beginning of the semester so that they, they know that you have a sense of humor. <laughs> wow, well, Lisa, thank you so much for sharing all of these great ideas. Um, I, 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 I'm just so impressed with how fully realize this class is. I mean, this, we know how much time this must have taken to put all this together. Yeah. Well, and thank you for the opportunity to share. And um, if anyone has any other questions that occur to them later, please don't hesitate to email me. Lisa, would you mind stopping the screen share so we can see you big screen and we can say goodbye. Okay. There we are. <laughs> Yay. So can we all unmute for just a moment to Bye. applaud Lisa? Okay. That's all the time we have for this webinar, but we hope that you walk away with some ideas that you want to try out with your students. Until next time.